Hey everyone, thanks for coming along to Quality Advocates. I hope you've all enjoyed the, the bank holiday. If you're here in the UK and uh, enjoyed the sun today as well. Uh, it's great to see so many people uh, coming through. So we've got 38 so far. So uh, we usually kick things off at sort of five past six. Um, so Rafaela, uh, if you're ready, it would be great for you to, to start the talk. Yeah, sure. Let me share my screen. Good stuff. Thanks very much. Uh, I think you need to enable uh, Billy. Um, have you? Yeah. It usually yeah. just works. Um, yeah, it says. Um, oh, yeah. Good stuff. We can see that. Cool. Let me just move this here. Okay, cool. So yeah, gonna start. Um, thanks, Billy, for in the invite. So yeah, hello everybody. I'm Rafaela, and I'm gonna share a bit of uh, my experience and lessons learned when hiring and onboarding a new QA. Um, yeah, a bit about me. So I have 12 years experience on QA and test automation strategy and um, architecture. Basically my entire family um, works with IT. My dad used to be a visual basic um, developer, then he opened a tech company and my mom used to be a COBOL developer. Um, my oldest brother, he used to be a C++ developer, but now he has this uh, Bitcoin exchange. So yeah, I started to learn coding when I was uh, six years uh, with Clipper. So you can imagine like it's quite old. <laughs> um, and I, I got really passionate about the QA area and created this uh, blog where you can find, um, oops, I think somebody needs to mute. Okay, cool. Um, and then I created this blog uh, where you can find posts about QA, leadership, DevOps and programming. So basically everything that I have learned in the past uh, years. Um, I also created this uh, Twitter account in the past month to share my posts. Uh, so you can follow me there, but it, there is not too much in it. Uh, but yeah, you can follow me there. Um, I don't know if you can notice as well. Ooh, again. Uh, I don't know if you can notice it by my accent, but I'm actually from Brazil. Uh, to be more specific from a seaside uh, town called Santos. And you can see the picture on the bottom left uh, side of the slide. So yeah, um, Brazilians like to change the classic uh, recipes. They exaggerate a bit on the ingredients. Um, and then, yeah, I post some things like, you know, if you go there, make sure that you order like this kind of things, like the pizza and the acai bowl that they put all of things on, in it. So, and also make sure that you can go to a kid's party because then in the end you have this uh, mashed cake with uh, these uh, balls of chocolate that we call uh, Brigadeiro basically. So yeah, I moved to London um, six years ago and uh, yeah, here I am now. So yeah, so on this first part, uh, I'm gonna talk about um, how to find a good QA. Um, and uh, some ideas for the interview stage, basically. So uh, on the first stage, you can have um, something like uh, the CV review, where you can filter for juniors, mid-level seniors, <clears throat> and also uh, check it for the tech skills that you are looking for. Um, on the second stage, it's more about the soft skills and future feed. Um, this is, again, it's just an idea because uh, when you are looking for a permanent, you need to make sure that you are working with, uh, you know, a person that is gonna be humble and uh, is gonna be a team player. So yeah, it's gonna be like eight hours a day, five days a week. So yeah, make sure that, you know, you are hiring the right person. Um, it's a lot of time. We actually spend more time with people that we work with than with uh, our own family, right? So for this reason, I put like this a second stage. Um, in my last um, interviews. So unless you are looking for a contractor because then, yeah, you don't need to worry about this too much because yeah, they are going, they are going to come uh, do the work and then they leave. So 
yeah, maybe just move a bit and put the technical skills uh, before. Um, and yeah, if you are looking for a per permanent, then uh, I, I was putting the technical assignment as the last stage, um, exactly because technical skills, I think it's easier to coach um, if the person has the right mindset and uh, is like proactive and can learn uh, things quickly. Um, so yeah, soft skills is really hard to change for the design pool, like the second one. Um, just to be sure that you are hiring the right person. Um, so yeah, on the CV review part, um, make sure that you know you can um, check if the person has um, like a portfolio and put like GitHub links, um, Stack Overflow, if they contribute to the community. This is really important because then you can check if the person, you know, uh, has passion about the area, like the QA area. Um, if it's a junior, they might not have uh, these kind of things, but it's okay. Uh, anyway, you can check this for the uh, more the seniors, right? Um, and I personally don't care about if the person has like masters or PhDs or certificates. Um, I think for me, real experience and exposure is more important to show the knowledge of the person. But uh, degree, degree is something that I consider um, if I need to make a decision between like two people and they have the same kind of experience and exposure. So yeah, um, and also another thing that you need to consider is like the team uh, distribution. So you, um, you can see what you are looking for. So if you have a team that you have more seniors, then might be a good idea to bring a junior now. Uh, if you have more juniors, then it might be a good idea to bring the seniors because you know that the seniors, they are going to be able to coach and mentor. Um, and also they have more uh, strong technical um, skills and interpersonal skills as well. And juniors, they tend to be a bit more uh, motivated and eager and adaptive to learn. And also it's easier to shape and mold them because you know they are really fresh uh, in the market. Um, in, then you can shape and mold in the way that you, you want basically your team. So yeah, it's really good to bring juniors as well if you can bring juniors. So yeah, you need to think about that as well. Um, and also from my experience, I, it's best to break into junior, mid, be, middle, and senior clusters. For example, um, having uh, four juniors, five middles, and uh, seven seniors. Um, this is uh, counting like project manager, team lead, tech lead, devs, and testers. Um, these proportions, they are more, um, most eff effective for most of the projects that I have worked with before. It doesn't mean that it's gonna work for you as well. So yeah, it's something that you can try and see if it works. Um, or, or if not, just yeah, try another approach basically. Uh, but yeah, this is what, okay. Uh, this is what I have been trying and uh, yeah, I saw that uh, it's really effective. Um, also, another thing that I consider is uh, exposure versus uh, experience, because you know I have seen all these uh, positions like on the job descriptions they put like oh yeah you need to have twelve years experience uh, working with this um, tool or something like that, but. Yeah, in the end, for me, exposure is more important. For example, somebody that worked 10 years uh, with the same tool and another person that worked uh, five years with the same tool as well, but, uh, you know, working in different projects with different teams and different companies. For me, this person has a bit more uh, knowledge because they jumped across different, um, yeah, different uh, projects and different mindsets. So they might bring something uh, new and a, a new way to think, um, which I think is really important when you are building your team because yeah, you, you need to have this share uh, knowledge mindset. Mm, and yeah, the culture fit. So I really like this uh, picture because you can really see like what is the difference between like, like the growth mindset and the fixed mindset. So, um, yeah, you need to look for someone that is gonna be ambitious and will try to learn something new every day. Um, don't have the thought that uh, knows everything already. 
uh, because yeah, I have worked with some people. They um, they think they know everything already. They don't want to learn. They don't want to try new things. So they are stuck in the, the same way of working like forever. Um, this is not really good because you know we work in IT. It's really a fast-paced, you know, industry. We are always changing. We are always evolving as well. So yeah, you need to bring someone that is gonna uh, come and uh, yeah, try to improve themselves and the team as well. Uh, somebody that is self-motivated, we will look for the positive side of things. Um, also, uh, has this uh, team spirit, team collaboration. Uh, not my job mentality. Because, you know, I have seen um, in some projects that even like developers, they don't want to help with the automation. And this is really hard to change. Like the mindset is really hard to change. So yeah, try to bring someone that is gonna be a uh, really team player and uh, you know, have that, uh, that fall of, yeah, we are building that. So let's do it together. And if you need help, I can help you. Yeah, and then we can, you know, uh, deliver this together basically. Uh, so I have worked in a startup that, you know, I, I had to help everybody uh, really like even like moving the offices and everything. And I didn't think it was like, you know, something uh, oh, I'm doing this and uh, it's a waste of time. No, because in the end of the day, yeah, you, you are working together with all these people. So yeah, it's basically like the mentality that you uh, need to bring to your team. Um, yeah, and I could have said, yeah, it's not my job. I'm not going to do it. But, you know, um, helping people is, uh, I don't know, it's something that I really like to do. And uh, yeah, I like to bring people with this, the same mindset um, uh, to my team to work with me, basically. So yeah, you need to bring someone that is curious as well. Um, we'll try a new approach to get better results. So it's not like fix it with the same tool and doing the same thing forever. Um, exactly because not when you learn something is doesn't mean that it's gonna work for all the projects that you work or that you are going to work um, and also team. So there is a lot of things to take into account basically. Um, look for someone that is humble, competent, um, share knowledge as well that they can uh, stand up and uh, raise their voice. Um, because even like if you bring like a, a, a introvert person to the team, uh, you need to make sure, you know, the person is gonna raise their voice and, uh, you know, be like a quality gate when we need and uh, these kind of things. So it doesn't, yeah, it doesn't need to be a extrovert person, basically, this is what I'm saying. Uh, but yeah, somebody that can uh, raise their voice. Um, and also be proactive, passionate. Um, and uh, yeah, you just need to make sure that you don't bring someone with this uh, fixed mindset. Uh, because as you can see, like, you know, the person doesn't have this uh, team spirit. And um, yeah, it, it, can, it can be stubborn as well, can create an uncomfortable environment. Um, and yeah, this selfish uh, thinking can uh, decrease the motivation of others. Um, and then you can also risk losing um, other team members. You really don't want that. Uh, yeah, you don't want that to happen, right? Um, so yeah, just make sure that you are not bring, bringing someone that can contaminate uh, the whole team just because of this mentality. And yeah, so what a good QA looks like. So I have been asking, uh, yeah, this was a question that um, somebody, during the interview they yeah they asked me that and then i thought yeah i don't know how to really reply there because it's so many things that you need to take into account right so i yeah i decided yeah let's put it here because i think you know i can give like an overview what i think it's a good qa and yeah what i like to uh you know you know qas that i like to bring to work with me so yeah they don't want they don't automate all the things, you know, sometimes they just automate things blindly testing uh, and creating all these scenarios for the regression pack. When it doesn't mean that it's gonna work, I mean, it doesn't mean that it's really like, um, yeah, uh, you know, the effort that you put on this is too much for uh, something that then you just want to prove that, you know, the quality of your product is there. So they need to work smarter, not harder. 
I have worked in projects that the people, they were so proud because they were working harder and working until 11 p.m. And then when you check the automation, they are testing uh, so many things uh, and are checking so many things that they didn't need to because in the end it was not adding any value. So yeah, you need to uh, look for someone that will um, look for the critical and acceptance criteria scenarios on the end-to-end -end, uh, automation and also that someone that is going to uh, try to cover uh, more tests on the API but it's still not covering like edge case. Um, so yeah, more that somebody that will have this mindset to cover uh, more tests on API and unit uh, level. Um, so, yeah, the program, programming skills. Mm. So basically you need to look for someone, you know, that can structure the uh, automation in a way that it's going to be maintainable. Um, so yeah, I ask them how they would do that, how they would structure the test framework. And also something like, you know, what is the designing pat patterns they know? Um, if it's a junior, they might not know what are the design patterns, but especially if it's like a manual QA, but if they are curious enough uh, and passionate about the area, they might have, you know, a bit of, um, basic um, knowledge so they might even know like just the name but not like knowing uh, exactly what are the details and everything um, also you can ask how how they you do you know they do the structure for the step definitions so this is something that i consider a lot because yeah you can have a really messy automation if you don't know how to create the uh, step definitions so you can have like a given, given, when, 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 then, 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 and then you duplicate everything and then, or even like using a, a step definitions that you cannot reuse after. So yeah, you need to make sure that you ask these during the interview process. Uh, so you don't have this problem after, you know, with, with the structure of the automation. Um, and then, yeah, if you have all these duplicating uh, steps, it, can be really complex to understand what's going on uh, with this scenario. So yeah, this is something really important as well. And uh, for API tests, uh, you can ask um, some questions, for example, uh, if they use the BDD for the scenarios and why. I have seen this uh, in one of my last projects. And uh, yeah, I was thinking, you know what, the business, they don't really, um, they are not interested to know uh, the API level of the things, how it's working. They want to know like the end-to-end -end flow and if the user is going to be able to uh, do what they need to do, basically. So, yeah, this is something that um, I, really, I really ask and I, I push to know what are the reasons because in the end of the day, they might just create a scenario with like, yeah, send this body and this header and then you're going to have this response uh but you know the business doesn't understand i got uh, some um answers like oh it's too complex our product is too complex we need to understand what we are doing but we are technical if the business is not interested to know uh the scenarios we can create like functions with the, you know, the proper names that are really descriptive and then we can follow from there because we are technical as well. It's not only like, you know, um, not only the developers, they are able to uh, follow basically. So yeah, this is something that I, uh, I always ask during the interview process. Um, and also how they handle the data. Um, they, I don't know, they can create the data from the feature file or JSON files or uh, database. So yeah, make sure that whatever is the uh, answer, it's uh, something that you can see that is going to be maintainable and they can, um, uh, they can reuse these after without any problems and everybody can understand as well. So yeah, uh, on, the, on this one is more about um, if they know what is what QA is responsible for, because I have seen some QAs uh, that want to embrace everything, and it's really hard because we are always want to 
one QA to two developers, three developers, four developers. Um, and then it's really hard because we, we keep like chasing them. So it needs to be somebody with this mentality of, you know, uh, they, they can have um, the quality, they can push for this quality uh, in the entire um, product. But even if it is, they know that they will focus more on these kind of tests. And then, yeah, the developers, they can do the unit and the integration uh, tests. And we can, like, the QAs, they can act, act like a coach uh, just to help to see if the coverage is good and if we miss it something. Um, yeah, this kind of thing. So, yeah, bring someone that knows what, what is the difference and, you know, somebody that is not going to embrace everything. And, yeah, so basically, yeah, one is quite uh, linked to the other. So it needs to be someone that, you know, has this uh, shift left uh, testing mind mindset. Um, so, yeah, the QA is going to act more like a coach and a specialist in the team that will bring uh, the quality um, as a whole for the, comp the, the, the product. And then um, also somebody that has this team spirit and collaboration. So avoid that. Uh, my project, nobody touch it. Uh, because yeah, I have seen some QAs, they don't want, they create the automation and they don't want anybody to help, even like other QAs, yeah, imagine developers, right? So yeah, it's really hard because in the end of the day, everybody is responsible to deliver this. Um, so you can always have this, you know, uh, open uh, mindset and be flexible because everybody has something to contribute. Even uh, like if, some, if it's something that is not, not, is not gonna add any value, but it's something that you can think about. And uh, yeah, we might try. Um, not every, I mean, I don't know everything. Nobody knows everything. It's really hard <laughs> to keep track of uh, everything that's going on and learn everything. So yeah, everybody needs to be able to contribute somehow. So yeah, create the PR reviews for the team and also check the PR reviews from uh, the developers. Um, so you can uh, also help them to increase the coverage on the unit tests and the uh, integration tests. And so yeah, don't bring it, uh, people that has this kind of mindset because then after, yeah, you cannot like improve the quality uh, for the automation project as well, which is part of the uh, the delivery, right? And yeah, um, so every project is singular. There is no one tool for all the different kind of situations, companies and teams. So a lot of things to take into account, basically. Um, and you need to find what is the best tool for your project. So yeah, make sure that when uh, you are um, doing the interview with the person, that they, <clears throat> they can show that they know a lot of tools, but they don't have like these arguments to say, yeah, uh, Google is using, so we should use as well. Because, you know, in the end of the day, Google is like a huge company. Um, you cannot compare um, your like startup to a company like Google or Microsoft, right? You can try, see if it works, do like a POC, uh, you know, um, check if that, that tool is going to, is gonna improve and is gonna uh, bring some value to the uh, automation or any other thing uh, to be honest even like ci cd pipelines uh, but yeah somebody that will be able to explore new tools and not coming with this mindset that yeah google is using we should use as well or just like block it with this um, uh, mentality that we should use the same tool for everything uh, so yeah basically you can ask questions like um, you can give like an example of like a, pro a project. Um, for example, you have limited time. Your framework is going to have little maintenance once it's released. So what tool uh, would you use it and why? So you can see how the person is going to react if they are going to say, yeah, I'm going to test some kind of different tools and see what is the best one. Or if they come with something like straight away, like, yeah, I'm going to use this one because this is what everybody's using now. Uh, so yeah, this is the kind of questions that you can ask um, just to see if the person has this um, mindset. 
Also, um, to see, uh, you can check if the person knows how to detach the UI dependency when it's possible. So, they can use like API instead of you waiting the page, uh, the page to render. So you can ask questions like, um, how would you manage the authentication? Because you know, some, I have seen some projects that uh, the QAs, they were creating the automation and uh, every time that they were doing the authentication and the login, they were doing through the UI. And this is quite a waste of time because yeah, you need to go and uh, wait the page, uh, the, page, the page to render, and then you do all the functions until you, you are actually on the, um, uh, on the website basically, and you have done the authentication. So some of the, uh, often it's okay, sometimes there is no way to do it, but most of the time you can use the APIs, uh, you can bypass, or you can think about changing something um, just for the QA uh, environment, just to bypass the authentication. So there are many approaches, and just see if the, uh, the, key, uh, the QA candidate can think about you know, different solutions for that. Um, and also, you know, sometimes you do the functional uh, UI and trend tests, but you can also do like UI tests, layout tests, just for, um, you know, just to check the other elements on the page. So, you know, you need to bring someone that will think about all these uh, kind of possibilities just to um, increase the test coverage and also uh, be able to um, reduce the time of the regression and uh, have more target um, tests. So, yeah, another question that you can, um, another thing that you can check actually is uh, just validate, see if they can validate the right expectations. So yeah, some of uh, the projects that I have worked at before, the QAs, they were um, just validating the, um, the status call uh, for the API tests. So yeah, this doesn't bring any value, right? You can check this, it's like a health endpoint. You could like just have a curl common and a I script and just check it these and this would be so much faster to create instead of like having this huge framework that you just test uh, that. So yeah, just make sure that, you know, the person is gonna validate the right expectations when doing the uh, API tests. And also for the UI tests, you can uh, ask um, things like uh, how they assert the page was loaded. Some of them, uh, uh, they check a lot of things like all the elements um, when you don't need to, right? You just need to make sure that you, uh, you are checking if the critical elements um, if they are loaded. So for example, for a login page, you expect to have what? The uh, input, the buttons there, so the, the user is gonna be able to do the login, right? So yeah, just make sure that the person knows what to check, uh, otherwise it's gonna be a massive uh, framework that is not gonna be really useful. So yeah, I have seen, a, yeah, I saw a project that the QA, um, was just checking for the title of the page. Like, yeah, the page was loaded because the title is there. I mean, who cares if the title is there, right? In the end of the day, the user uh, doesn't really like, it doesn't even like check the title. Uh, it's more about the elements on the page, right? Uh, and it's gonna be, bring so much value as well. The title doesn't bring anything. It can be just a minor issue, but it's nothing like blocking the user to um, continue the flow, basically. Um, and yeah, press screening coding test. Well, now is the different uh, difference between press screening coding and a real time coding test. Uh, press screening is when you send the code, like not the code, but the test to the candidate um, up front. Um, and then they have time to code the framework um, or um, just the task that you um, you are asking. So basically you have some, yeah, disadvantages and advantages for that. So when I send the code um, before, they they might turn down, yeah, some candidates they might turn down, but these um, shows like the level of commitment for these, um, for this uh, position as well. 
So it's, yeah, it's kind of a balance. So you can, yeah, you can have a problem with that, but at the same time, maybe it's a good thing <laughs> in the end. Um, and then, yeah, you have less visibility. So you don't know if it's really the person that is coding on the other side. So yeah, for this is when you actually need another stage just to check, yeah, you have done this code and it was not somebody else. Um, and also another thing uh, is uh, they are never able to show everything they want uh, because you know, you say, yeah, it's gonna take one hour. So sometimes they take a bit more because um, they want to show everything they want to do. So yeah, I'm gonna do this and then I'm gonna create this Docker file as well, this Jenkins file. I'm gonna uh, improve the report. So sometimes some of them, they might even take it even longer, like than one hour. And then the ones that take like just one hour because they know, yeah, I'm gonna do that and that's it, I'm gonna send. Um, they might, yeah, think about, yeah, I could have uh, done that, I could have created this Docker file. So they, they're always something to improve um, when they are doing exactly because they are doing it on their own time and the, or they will take longer, like ages to finish or they are going to finish and then think about all the things they could have done as well. Um, but yeah, the advantages as well, like, yeah, you know, like they're more, it's a more close to reality situation. So they have less pressure when they are coding, they can do on their uh, own time, they can have breaks, they can just like, you know, grab a coffee and something like that. So yeah, you know, that is more, uh, is more close to the day to day activity, like the real world, let's say. And uh, yeah, real time coding tests. So you basically the candidate will have more pressure because uh, they know that there is another person like just watching you and it's quite, yeah, it's quite complex <laughs> because then you don't feel like comfortable, right? Um, I mean, some people they feel and that's okay, but you cannot assume that everybody's gonna be the same. So yeah, basically you have just one stage because you know, you can see the person is coding on the other side. So you know that is, is not somebody else. Um, it's not too close to the day-to-day -day activity exactly because you have this other pers person like watching you, but you have more visibility. So you can always check uh, the reaction when, when under pressure as well. Keep asking questions and talk to them. Um, maybe uh, just to make sure they, they don't feel like, um, yeah, too much under pressure when coding. Uh, but an idea and uh, something that I have seen that is much better uh, instead of just coding um, is uh, creating a framework with uh, bad practice. And then you can go through with them and check what they could improve and then they can explain themselves. So they don't need to code and remember the syntax maybe if you are not using, um, you know, something that has the, um, the intelligence already. Um, and also this in encourages like the creativity. So when you're um, asking the questions, they can, oh, okay, I think this one, I would improve doing that. And then they can come up with all the, you know, they bring all the experience and they bring everything they have learned before exactly to uh, show what they know basically, which is really good. Even though they are under pressure, I think, yeah, this kind of uh, test um, is better exactly because you have this kind of, you know, it's like a shed, it's not like watching other uh, person um, coding, right? Um, and the, yeah, so basically now the onboarding, the second part, this um, is really important as well because you know, good in onboarding means good reputation for you and the company. Uh, and uh, it can be damaged if you don't give proper attention on the onboarding process. So it's something that I, I really uh, highlight every time. Uh, remember that, you know, do have empathy. Uh, not everybody's going to be at the same speed of others as everybody has a different like background and experience. Um, you are dealing with human beings, basically. It, it's not like a binary situation where, uh, yeah, this person is going, yeah, is, re, is being like fast and can set up everything on the first day and then they are already like picking up activities and uh, tickets on the first day. The second person, like the second candidate might not do that. 
So yeah, don't create like these high uh, expectations because yeah, everybody's different and yeah, it's not only about uh, experience. Um, it's always about yeah, the soft skills as well and how the person is, um, the personality basically. So yeah, if you are a leader, um, you need to understand people, of course. Uh, so don't micromanage, uh, be helpful instead. Uh, as everybody's uh, working remotely uh, now, it's quite hard to see what the other person is doing. But yeah, the right way to approach them and see if they're struggling with something is just like be helpful, check if they need something, if they have any blockers, um, how they are doing, instead of checking, oh, you haven't done that, what are you doing now? You know, these kind of questions. Just try to avoid. Um, Exactly because you don't know how uh, is the person on the other side. So yeah, don't make them feel like not welcome, basically. Uh, yeah, they might feel uncomfortable and shy as well. So for this reason, again, just try to be helpful. Uh, um, and then just speak to them, basically. And also try to be a, a point of reference. So if they need uh, direction, even if you don't know something, at least like point to the person that might know. Um, so at least they, they know that, okay, I can come to you first. You can direct me to the person that might know uh, how to solve my issue. And uh, yeah, so on the first week, you can expect them to set up the tools and environment, and then um, also know the product, the company, understand the process so prepare like two links um, also like you know everything that you are using um, add then to the chat system so if you are using slack or teams just uh, remember to add them up front and uh, prepare some guidelines um, give them x and permissions um, up front as well try to remember everything or put like a checklist if you uh, haven't done it, at least they can go through and they can ask, oh, I, I don't have permission for that. So yeah, just prepare everything up front because they are going to waste quite some time just with the, uh, you know, setting up uh, the tools and the environment. Um, also the team introduction. So this is, really, uh, this is really important because this will make them feel uh, more, you know, welcome. So prepare video calls now that we are uh, all remote as well. You know, they need to have the feeling they are not talking to a machine. So try to uh, book, I don't know, if you have like a team that is, is huge, like it's not, it's not a small team, just, um, yeah, separate the video calls and the meetings uh, so they can try, you know, match the face with the name. It's going to be hard anyway, because it's a lot of people to know um, on, you know, on the first week, but at least they can try to uh, remember. And also add then to the stand-ups. So um, not the, maybe not the first day, because I think the first day they will arrive and they don't know exactly what is going to be the time of the stand-up. So maybe from the second day um, and forward. And also, yeah, make them feel welcome. Basically, during these video calls, just like, yeah, have one with the, uh, I don't know, the tech and tech leaders and another with the developers uh, or one with this project and another with this project. So, yeah, just uh, make them feel welcome. Um, it's really important, especially now. And, yeah, the products, basically. So, yeah, they need to know what they are testing, why they are testing. So prepare some diagrams, explain uh, what is the project architecture, uh, prepare some, I don't know, whiteboarding uh, sessions as well. So you can go through the product and explain everything like, yeah, we are doing that because of that. And then um, everything, you know, that is important for them to know about the project so they can start to think about, you know, the scenarios and everything. Um, and the company, so yeah, this is um, just to have about like an informal chat, uh, explaining about how is the future, uh, the future of the company, the values and these kind of things. Um, also prepare the useful links, so you know, HR, um, support tickets where they can raise. Um, so yeah, make it sure that you have everything uh, maybe on the welcome, in the welcome email, 
or maybe in your onboarding uh, page. And I also have this workflow, um, maybe just a page with the workflow explaining how things are moving across the boards, like the tickets, or maybe just have a session and show them how to do, you know, ah, okay, you have this ticket, uh, this is how you create the bug, and then this is what you need to do when moving the tickets across the board. Also assign them to a mentor or a, um, a buddy, uh, some yeah, companies, they give different names for that, but you just should have somebody else as a point of reference, not only your leader. So you can, um, you can uh, have this as another point of reference and, uh, you know, have, I don't know, have some coffee and this kind of things like virtual coffee, actually. And also documentation. Yeah, so prepare how to steps, wikis, um, and um, this onboarding page. Um, maybe if you have everything on the welcome email, you don't need to um, worry about that, but it's always good to have this as a point of reference if they uh, don't remember that everything was on the email or what was on the email or they have lost the email. Just make sure that you have this, um, this page as well so they can uh, use when they are looking for something uh, on the first and the second week. And yeah, the feedback part. So yeah, this is really important, like giving and receiving feedback on the first week. So you can try to improve something uh, already, um, or you know, you can like point then and uh, be assertive and clear on the expectations. So, you know, they might feel like a bit lost. So yeah, just give them the feedback about, you know, if you need anything, just come to me. Um, but yeah, be assertive uh, when doing that when giving the feedback and also yeah, collecting the feedback. So you can do that through the, um, through like a survey or just have one-on-one -on -one or just informal chat like, oh, do you have a uh, free time now? And then you can just um, call them to, yeah, check if everything's okay, basically. And yeah, the second week. So the second week is more about, you know, they have everything set up already. They know everybody. <laughs> they cannot remember the name of everybody, but at least, yeah, they know who is who uh, or have an idea. Uh, and then you can prepare some shadow sessions for programming as well, um, give them some, some assignments. I would suggest you uh, start with, you know, manual tickets first so they can have the feeling of how it's going to be the day-to-day uh, -day activity so basically and how is the project uh, how is the project how is the product so you know just give them these um, manual tickets first do some exploratory tests so they can understand how is uh, the product and um, the project and also like start to move things across the board and uh, yeah, this is really good to have on the second week as well. Um, also, if you can have this on the first week, it's okay. Just be sure that you are not like um, overloading them with all this information. Um, but yeah, uh, have these kind of workshops to share uh, knowledge and uh, also standards that you are following. Um, because you know, when, when you want to improve like you know, if you are a leader, then you want to, you want to probably want improve people to have like the best version of themselves. So um, create these workshops exactly to share the knowledge and uh, inspiring the new joiner to constant learn and share uh, knowledge with regular workshops. So yeah, if you show like, yeah, we are using these two and this is how we are doing and then just show and explain everything to them. Um, yeah, they, they will think, okay, I came to learn and, uh, yeah, I'm learning already a lot and then I can bring this, this is open, you can show like, you know, um, you, um, you support them to do the same, like share the knowledge with the, these kind of workshops. Um, and also, uh, prepare some backlog. So if they have finished, uh, with the assignments they can go through the QA backlog and um, pick up like tickets from there just to continue, um, you know, the work and, you know, I'm not blocked, I can pick up new things to do. So yeah, this, yeah, it's basically that. So in the end of the day, it's more like collaboration, right? That 
you can see that it's really important. Um, and yeah, that's it. So here's my LinkedIn and uh, my blog. I try to post um, once a week, but now it's quite hard. So it's, I don't know, and now it's just once a month. Uh, but yeah, you can follow me there. You can add me on LinkedIn as well. And uh, yeah, if you have any questions, just um, I can go through them now. Um, but yeah, thanks. Let me see. I'm checking the chat. But... Okay, so is experience or education certifications more key? Um, well, I think it is a bit of, you know, a bit of everything, but I really prefer to focus on the experience because for me it's more important. You know, when you apply for these certifications, like you remember like just on the time that you are doing the test and then you kind of forget after. Let's be honest, you study just for the certification when you pass and then you don't really go uh, and check this again. So you always try to learn something new and it's, yeah, it's not, it doesn't mean that you are going to use, you know, something that you studied like 10 years ago to pass on this certification that you can use now. So I, I would say that is more um, experience. But yeah, something like certification and education shows that the person is really motivated about learning and is really passionate about the area as well. So it's something that you can consider um, after you check the experience, right? So yeah, based on your own experience, how long do you believe that would take for a new journey to be fully operational? Um, I would say uh, it depends. Um, I think it, uh, if it's a junior, then it might take, I don't know, might take like a month or even more. But if it's um, a senior, then you can expect like some days, to be honest, depending on uh, the, yeah, it depends on the level of the seniority, basically. Why did you pick up BDD and not other methodologies for finding the depth of a personal knowledge? Um, this is because, well, BDD is something that um, I really like to, uh, I don't know, I, I always check exactly because I have seen like uh, people and I pick up BDD exactly because most of the people they are using, but you can check uh, any other um, methodologies, not only that. It's just because, yeah, I see that a lot of people use nowadays and it's something that, you know, everybody knows a bit. Um, so it's something that I like to double check and see if the person is not like over complicating and duplicating scenarios because yeah, it can get really messy. And if you don't, yeah, if you are not instructing in a right way, you can like just uh, have like a messy code that no, it's gonna be hard to maintain. Um, but yeah, I yeah, I pick up like BDD um, just because yeah, it's something that most of the, the people like know nowadays. Uh, do you use it to myself for a new journey? Yes, I use that. So yeah, you can have um, the milestones yeah, for uh, the new joiners. So for example, in 30 days, you expect them to uh, you know, do that and you can uh, have like a QA letter actually. Um, and then you can share with them, uh, you know, I'm expecting you to be fully you know, understanding about this product and doing the automation already without any help. Um, and then you can create these milestones for them. Um, it's really good actually um, for this is on the survey and the one-on-one -on -one is always good to check um, if they understand what are the expectations what's your experience in hiring someone who has a really strong QA background but programming language that they are using different from what your team is using mm. Um, I think it's okay, you know, because the person has a really strong, yeah, the person has a really strong, you know, QA background, um, but not programming language. Yeah, this is, uh, this is really hard because then it means that you need to 
understand this person is gonna come and is gonna uh, spend quite some time trying to yeah learn the code the programming language that you are using. If it's a senior, I don't think you can yeah worry too much about it because um, seniors you know they pick up things quite easily. Uh, but if it's a junior, then yeah you can you can expect you to coach quite a lot then so. But yeah, if he's a senior, you can expect them to, you know, just pick up whatever is the programming language that you are using. Um, it quite, yeah, it can take some time as well, but um, yeah, you, basically they will be autonomous. This is what I'm saying, basically. Yeah. Yeah, this is, um, actually, um, I just hired someone like that uh, in my team. And uh, I knew from the beginning that he was really strong, you know, QA, uh, QA, manual QA experience. And he knows, he understands about the process, but uh, he doesn't have um, programming language skills. So from the beginning, I knew that, you know, we need to have some workshops um, and uh, yeah, we need to coach you um, and the seniors, the other senior team members, they will need to coach you as well. But it's all good if you have this time to coach. I think it's fair enough because it's always good to bring someone, you know, with this fresh mindset um, and uh, is eager to learn. Usually like these manual QAs, they are really eager to learn something uh, uh, on the automation side as well because they don't have any experience. So if you have time to coach, I would say, yeah, just go for it because I think it's really useful. Like, you know, it's good for you, for the person and for the team as well. A QA mindset is completely different from the mindset of a developer. How do, put, uh, how do you put, com how do put combine all this when recruiting a QA that think like both? Oh yeah, this is really good one. Um, yeah, this is really hard because when you hire QA, they have this mindset and yeah, developers, they have this completely different. Uh, but yeah, when you are uh, doing the soft skills basically and uh, all these um, questions about, and even like during the technical assignment, you can check, you know, because developers, I don't want to say that because yeah, most of them, they, they have this, um, uh, mindset to you know try to over complex a bit the test automation when test automation needs to be something straightforward it, if it's too complex if you are spending too much time with the you know automation with the maintenance of the automation something is wrong um, it needs to be something that you can quickly like create maintain and uh, just get things out of the door uh, but also not losing like the quality right so yeah, just make sure when you are doing the, uh, the interview uh, process that you can uh, check, you know, if the person is not gonna like over, comp uh, over complex things. Um, when, for example, you are showing the test framework and uh, checking the, you know, sending the test, um, if they are not like, yeah, creating things that you don't need to like putting too much effort on something that you could have done in with one line um, of code basically. And also check what they, you know, this QA res responsibility uh, division basically. So uh, yeah, I think I, I have explained this before, but yeah, you can check what they would cover uh, if they would like, uh, mm, try to push things to cover more on the unit and integration level, not only on the, uh, you know, the end-to-end, um, because, you know, the regression uh, end-to-end tests, is they, um, they are more to make sure that things that you are delivering, new things that you are delivering are not breaking the old things. Um, so yeah, just uh, make sure that you can check it out when doing the interview as well. Price screening coding tests are written for a developer or a tester tests test. So why are you assessing their development skills? Um, because you know, testers they can help with the automation as well. Not you know, it's not only um, well, it depends on what you are looking for, to be honest. Because if you are looking for a tester that is not gonna do any automation, then yeah, you definitely don't need to uh, send this um, 
display screening coding tasks. But if you expect expect them to do the um, automation as well, then yeah, you need to check the programming skills. But you don't expect them to do uh, everything that a developer would do. I'm not saying that, definitely not. Uh, but you can expect them to, you know, um, create the automation and be able to identify what you validate and expect. Um, so uh, yeah, is is really really depends off what you are looking for. Um, but nowadays, I still like it. Yeah, the QAs, they are doing a bit of, at least from my experience. Uh, I have done a lot of uh, development tasks and also uh, DevOps, like DevOps that is not, nothing, um, nothing related to QA, but I was always like checking the pipelines and uh, maintaining them because, you know, QA nowadays is more like, um, is more like a specialist uh, in the team. Um, so they are more like checking if we have this cute quality across the uh, project because you know we are always like one to like two three developers so we need to make uh, we need to be a bit more um, smart when uh, thinking about all these kind of test strategies um, but yeah one of the cons of press screening coding test is if it's uh, fair for a tester to overcommit to a role that one is not sure of getting suitable for them to. Uh, the high pressure during real-time coding make a candidate perform really badly. I agree. How would you advise to calm the candidate down? <laughs> yeah, for this reason I said that um, I think, for, yeah, from what I have seen, like coding uh, during the real-time uh, test is really hard for them. Some of them, they get really lost and uh, yeah, it's not what you want, right? You are not checking, uh, you know, if the person is gonna like completely like block, be completely blocked and cannot do anything. Um, you want to check if they are able to do um, the automation, um, you know, in the real world with like, you know, especially now that we, yeah, we have this problem with the coronavirus. So yeah, they, they, they probably are like so under pressure. So one thing that I advise is just, yeah, create this, um, this um, test, which is more about a chat. It's just like, you know, it's not gonna be something they will go and uh, code because I think, you know, when you are under pressure, it's really hard to think, <laughs> think uh, properly when you are doing the, te the, the technical assignment. Um, so, yeah, the chat is something more like informal and you can check their abilities and think about, yeah, I would do that and then they can go back um, uh, to their uh, experience and check, um, yeah, what they would do doing to improve the test framework. So, yeah, this is something that I think is much better. And I actually had really good uh, feedbacks uh, from the candidates um, they interviewed um, lately. So they were saying that this was a really good test exactly because they didn't they didn't need to code, um, and I could act, uh, assess like the uh, experience and the technical uh, skills as well, um, even though they were not coding at all. Um, so yeah, what do you prefer, pre-screening or the real-time one? Um, I think. I think I prefer the real time one. Oh, no, I actually prefer the pre screening one exactly because I, I can uh, do on my own time and is more close to the reality. Um, but yeah, I understand that, um, you know, on the other side, it's really good to have just one stage, right? And then you can just talk um, about the, you can just talk about um, the test. Um, yeah, and you don't need to really be worried about um, spending another time doing the pre-screening test. Um, can you give an example of a pre-screening test that you have created? Um, yes, uh, let me see. So one that I have used it before for API tests, if you want, yeah, if you want to hire someone that, you know, is gonna work with backend uh, API tests, you can use, I don't know, something like dummy example um, website and then 
ask them to create like a test framework that is gonna um, is gonna check uh, the endpoints there, and then you can uh, see if they think about the validations, uh, how to structure as well. So yeah, this is something that I have used before for the API tests. Uh, but for the UI, I just use it, I don't know, any public website, to be honest, and then I can, I just create like a scenario and ask it then to create the uh, framework from the uh, Micron bot. Oh, the test is user here, not a whole competition. Yeah, uh, agree. It's not who can code better competition. Um, for this is I always try to bring in this sense of collaboration because you know everybody has a different uh, experience and background so we can always try to improve something it's not like a competition about you know yeah I can do it you can also um, yeah you need to bring someone with this mindset that you know is gonna just see things like yeah we can do what we can try to do something uh, like that, I, I don't know everything because nobody knows everything. It's really hard. Um, so yeah, I agree. Pre screening. Uh, oh my God, so many questions. Go. Pre screening code test should be done if you are hiring for a position that requires a good level of development. Yes, agree. If you are a man of QA and you apply to a hold that requires a automation knowledge, if the company likes you, this Pre screening test should be changed to adapt to the level of the candidate. Agree. You can learn how to code layer if the company also has the mindset of helping their employees to, yep, to develop their skills. This should not define someone as a good or a bad QA. Um, no, it's not. Yeah, definitely not. I agree. Um, I think it's more about the mindset, right? And if the person has, um, uh, you know, has the eager to learn um, and also yeah if the company has time and has somebody that can be can can coach um, so yeah I don't think it is uh, there is testing and tools just the testing again many articles why yes you don't have automation in manual doctor yeah they use tools agree Michael Yes, is it because you yeah, know we can change it if you teach other about an industry? Yes, <laughs> yeah, no, it's okay. I think everybody is like needs to raise their voice. I agree, but yeah, uh, hey, just, just to jump in, Rafaela. Sorry, if you could go through just one more question, I know there's, sure. there's quite a lot of questions. That yeah, I can see there are lots. Yeah. Oh, okay. Um, let's see. I've, okay. I've shared the quality advocate Slack channel as well. So if you'd be happy to answer further questions there, um, that'd be great too. People are happy to join. But yeah, if you could just see one more question. Yeah. Okay. I hope you have one more. So how can you make sure the person understand the priorities? Uh, well, you can check if it, you know. You can give an example of um, a project and say, you know, uh, we need to deliver this, uh, and then uh, what do you test like for this, uh, for this uh, uh, particular scenario? Uh, and then just check if the person can uh, actually pick up the scenario that, you know, is gonna test the accept acceptance criteria first and make sure this is working. And also like, you know, if they don't have time to do the automation and the, you know, they can uh, just do the, um, create the automation ticket to check on the backlog after, which is not great because then you're working kind of like a waterfall process. But yeah, sometimes you don't have time or maybe you can coach the developers to help you as well. Depends of the situation, right? And how is your team? But yeah, just make sure they, um, they can uh, check what is the priority. Uh, by uh, checking what they would test for the scenario. So yeah, if they can uh, pick up like acceptance criteria first and uh, make sure that this is working fine uh, and the user is able actually to do what they need to do. Um, but yeah, I think that's it. Um, so yeah, Billy. Awesome. Well, look, thanks very much for 
Paul, for so, putting so much effort into this talk uh, and sharing your experiences uh, so far. It's really informative. And another huge thank you for taking time out of your, your day off. No worries. Uh, to, <laughs> to share some insights with quality advocates. Um, yeah, really good questions there. Sorry we couldn't get yep. through them all. Um, but we do have, a, as I've mentioned, a quality advocates Slack channel. So if anyone wants to reach out, it'd be great if they could contact you from there or they want to reach out. Is it best via LinkedIn, Twitter? What do you prefer, Rafaela? Yeah, yeah. Um, could be LinkedIn. Yeah, it's fine. I think I, I'm more active on there, to be honest. Okay, good stuff. Well, look, thanks again. Thanks, everyone, for coming along. And enjoy, uh, enjoy your evenings. Thank you. Bye. Cheers, guys. Bye-bye.